I like having that little uh, peppy kickoff here. So, Hey, so when, when I was talking with Pastor Tom in the uh, weeks leading up to the sermon series, uh, Movies of Our Life, uh, I've been able to reflect on why movies matter. Why, why do certain movies stick with us more than others? And, and the truth is it's because of the memories, right? We have memories with some of these movies. And uh, for me, one of these movies is the series. Again, there's not just one, but there's three, The Mighty Ducks. And I, I looked through uh, some of the different surveys and things that you all have turned in, and other people mentioned The Mighty Ducks, believe it or not. It's not just me, but uh, we all have different memories or, or times where a movie stuck out with us. And that's the case for me. So I remember when I was in elementary school, and when I occasionally got a cold or like a flu bug, I, I would get to stay home from school. You know, you remember that? Like when you just weren't feeling good, but it wasn't that sick, but it was enough that I got to stay home from school. And I remember I'd have to rest for a while, but then the most amazing thing happened. Mom would always bring in her TV with the VCR built in. Now for anyone that doesn't know, that's what it looked like. So I, I love that I'm not the youngest one anymore. So this is the TV with the VCR built in, not that exact one, but uh, she would bring that in and I, I would get the opportunity to watch a movie while I rested and almost every time I picked The Mighty Ducks and I'd work my way through that three pack of movies. I started to not hate being sick all the time and uh, sometimes I was sick, if you know what I mean, and I would stay home to watch The Mighty Ducks. These movies were a part of my upbringing and my childhood, and they taught me lessons that I didn't know then, but I can identify now that I, that I didn't see. And so I want to quickly run through what the three different movies, what they're about, very broad, because I do encourage you to watch them. If you need to borrow them, I have them. Um, so the first one, the original Mighty Ducks, it, it is out on Disney Plus if you want to watch it there. Um, it, it's this whole idea of a failing district hockey team gets paired up with this reluctant hockey coach and through ups and downs the hockey coach eventually falls in love with the kids and loves to to work with them the kids start liking him and he changes them they change him and they find success I mean that's a big oversimplification but uh, that's what that movie's about and the sequels are somewhat similar the second one is where they uh, the mighty ducks go off and they become team USA junior hockey and then the third one is where they become part of a, a, a private school and play hockey against the, the horrible veteran, or the, the, the varsity uh, hockey team. So those are the three different movies, but I'm going to focus today on D2, The Mighty Ducks, the second one, because it's my favorite and I think it has some of the more iconic scenes uh, from the movies. In the movie, the original Mighty Ducks team, the ones that came from the first movie, are joined by others from across the United States that have been selected to be part of Team USA Junior Hockey. And the movie is all about how this team learns to work together, live together, and eventually win together. All this builds up to say, I believe that the church works the same way. I believe that the church, the body of Christ that you and I are called to be a part of, and today, just so you know, when I say church, I'm talking big church, right? Not just Grandview, but God's church. I believe the church should work the same way that we should learn to work, live, and eventually win together. That we are going to be able to learn from a silly Disney movie how the church is called to action in this world. And I believe right now in our country, in our communities, People need to hear about a better way of living. We've been talking about that since, since March or April, that there, there's a lot of stuff going on outside these walls and that we as the church have something unique to offer them if we work together like that good hockey team. But here's the truth. Teams don't always start out perfect. And I want to show this one-minute clip first to, to show what happens when the Mighty Ducks, the original team, is met and introduced to their new teammates and what happens when they're first asked, asked to work together? Remember, they're different people from different walks of life with different ways of doing things, trying to find a way to move together. Let's watch this. I don't want to make this any clearer. You are a team. And to win this thing, you have to work 
as one. Now as one, skate. Everyone goes their own way, everyone falls down. Now get up and try it again. All right, all of you move to your right, now. Who makes you boss? Everyone to the left. You guys can argue all you want, but I'm not untying you until you move as one. That's it, now you're learning. Communication, that's it. Good, together, move together. Charge, all right, right, turn. Turn right, that's it, that's it. All right, starting to look like hockey players. I'm proud of you, team. You worked hard today. Things don't always start off easy for the team. And I, and I watched this clip this week and I was reminded of that scripture. If a house is divided against itself, that house cannot stand. We saw that physically played out there, right? They, they all tried to go their own way and they all fell down. The Ducks team embodied that, but their, their team coach, the coach pushed them away from that way of playing. And he used this quote. I love this line. You are a team. To win this thing, you have to work as one. Those words are true for the Mighty Ducks Team USA, and they're true for God's church. They're true for us as the church. To win this thing, we have to work as one. Fill in the word win with what we're called to do as Christians. You could say, church, to share the good news of Jesus, you have to work as one. To help those in your community, you have to work as one. To offer hope to the hopeless, you have to work as one. And to bring light into the darkness, you have to work as one. We're going to keep going on this today. Not that Grandview's missing it, but that I think we're part of this bigger church that, that sometimes forgets to do things to win. We have to work as one. It's a fair reminder for all of us in this Christian journey that we are like the mighty ducks. How did I say it earlier here? From different walks of life, from different walks of life, for, with different ideas, with different ideas of how to do things, we have to come together, work together as one to make a difference. It calls us to be part of a team. So go back to Team Mighty Ducks here. They go throughout the movie. They seem to work better together after this scene, and they have times where they lose their way. But in the end, they're up against the big opposition. They're against the main opposition, opposing team. Does anybody remember what the team was? Iceland, Team Iceland. And like any good sports movie, the, the, the game's not going great at the end. But they have a locker room talk, right? Like every good sports movie, a locker room talk that changes everything. Let's watch this. No matter what people say or do, we have to be ourselves. You. Who are you? Dean Portman. From where? Chicago, Illinois. You. Guy Germain. From where? Uh, St. Paul, Minnesota. You. I'm Jesse Hall from Minneapolis, Minnesota. Who are you? Julie Gaffney from Bangor, Maine. Luis Mendoza, Miami, Florida. Greg Goldberg, Philadelphia, Pennsylvania. Les Averman, Brooklyn Park, Minnesota. Fulton Reed, Stillwater, Minnesota. Russ Tyler, South Central Los Angeles. Charlie Conway, Minneapolis, Minnesota. Ken Rue, San Francisco, California. Connie Moreau, Minneapolis, Minnesota. Adam Banks, Dinah, Minnesota. Dwayne Robinson, Austin, Texas. Michelle McKay, Duluth, Minnesota. And I'm Gordon Bombay, Minneapolis, Minnesota. Yeah! We're Team USA, gathered from all across America. And we're gonna stick together. You know why? Because we are ducks, and ducks fly together. That's right, Jan. And just when you think they're about to break apart, ducks Ducks fly fly together. together! And when the wind blows hard and the sky is black, ducks fly together! And when the roosters are crowing and the cows are spinning circles in the pasture, Okay. And when everyone says it can't be done, ducks fly together. That scene gets, I'm not emotional, but just love that scene. It, it calls us to action. It's this group of people gathered from all over the nation, from different backgrounds, each with their unique story, but they come together to form something much more powerful than what they can do alone. Does that sound like something else to you? Because to me, it sounds like the church. And that refrain, back and forth, that's what gets me, right? Ducks fly together. When you think they're about to break apart, 
ducks fly together. When the wind blows hard and the sky is black, ducks fly together. When roosters are crow, I didn't write that one down, whatever he said there. <laughs> My favorite though, when everyone says it can't be done, ducks fly together. Church, those words, that refrain, it pushes us towards our mission. That like the mighty ducks, we're people from different walks of life with different stories, whether you're in this room, whether you're watching at home, whether you've been to Grandview, whether you've never even heard of Grandview, the church, we all have our own unique backstories, things that make us different. But Jesus, following Jesus, gives us a commonality that's way bigger than our differences, that we're called to work and to act and to move together. That's where the book of Philippians comes in, and we read it already, but I want to break it down. I want to break it down for us and look at what it calls us to action and how in this world where the world really needs the church, this scripture helps us. And if you've been around, I love lists. It's how I think. I think it helps organize some of the things, and I hope it helps you as well. We're going to look at Philippians 4, verses 1 through 9 here, and there's four ideas that I think come out of it that the church is called to be. The church is called to be united, the church is called to be focused, the church is called to be praying, and the church is called to be acting. We're going to break it down again, united, focused, praying, and acting. Philippians 4.2, for the first one, for, for united, it says, I urge Euodia, Paul's writing to the church in Philippi, I urge Euodia to iron out their differences and to make up because God doesn't want his children holding grudges. It's this passage from Philippians where the, the Apostle Paul is writing to that church and obviously these two women, Yodia and Syntyche, aren't getting along about something and they've been really prominent in the church. They've, they've been helping in the church and so Paul writes to them and says, guys, you've got to quit fighting. Whatever your fight's about, you've lost track of what you should be united by. You've lost track on the idea that we should be following, proclaiming, and living for Jesus. God's called his church to be united. Like it said earlier, a house divided against itself cannot stand. So God's church, again, I'm talking about capital C, universal church, is called to be united. And Paul calls these two women out and, and says, you need to be of one mind. You need to have that common ground. You need to find your common ground and stick to it. Quit focusing on what causes you to differ, but instead find your common purpose. And church, I believe that that's what we're called to as well. But it's important to understand there are nuances to this teaching. And Pastor Tom, I, I don't remember, maybe in, in the last year, talked about this, the difference between unity and uniformity. There's a difference between being unified and being uniform. Uniform means we're all the same, that we have no differences, no uniqueness. We're cookie cutouts of each other. And that's not what God's calling us to be. But instead, he's calling us to be united. That though we're different, though, though we may all have our uniqueness, we're called to be united for the same outcome, the same purpose, the same goal, that same common bond in Jesus Christ. I found this quote this week. Unity must be of the mind and heart, a sense of belonging together and of facing together those who attack it. Think back to the Mighty Ducks unity of mind and heart. They had one purpose. They had this goal to win. They had a sense of belonging. They were in it together. Ducks fly together. And they were all about opposing those who attack it, the Iceland team, right? We are called to the same thing, to be united in mind of purpose and to take on anything that opposes it. They were a team and you and I are called to be part of a team individually, locally here at Grandview and of God's bigger team to be united for his purpose. And once we talk about being united, we need to talk about being focused. Philippians 4.1 says, my dear, dear friends, I love you so much. Paul writes, I want the very best for you because you make me feel such joy. You fill me with pride. So don't waver, stay on track and stay steady in God. Verse 8 says you need to fill your minds and meditate on the things of God, those things that are true, that are noble, that are reputable, that are compelling, the best, not the worst, the beautiful, not the ugly, things to praise, not to curse. So if we say we're united, then we need to also be focused. 
Don't waver. Stay on track. Stay steady in God. Paul's reminding the church in Philippi, and Paul is reminding us that we need to be unified and we need to be focused on one thing. We have one goal, right? right? We tell that to some people. You had one job. We have one job. Stay on track. Stay focused and fill your minds with the things of God. The truth is unity requires focus. There's no doubt that these two work together, and Paul is saying to the church then and is saying to us now, even if you are unified and working together, you need to remember what you're working for. Because the truth is, as the church or as individuals, it's easy to get distracted. Easy to get distracted, like the dog and up, right? That we're all in, we're all in, we're all in, and then we go squirrel, right? And we get distracted easily. Paul reminds us that as followers of Jesus, we need to stay focused on the task, focused on our connection with God so that we don't stumble, that we don't fall, that we stay strong so that we may make a difference. So we talk about the church being united, we talk about the church being focused, and we need to talk about the church in prayer. Philippians 4 verses 6 through 7 say, don't fret, don't worry, so instead of worrying, pray. Pray. Let your petitions and praises shape your worries into prayers, letting God know your concerns. And before you know it, a sense of God's wholeness will displace all that worry. The church, and all of us as part of the church, we're called to unity, we're called to be focused, and we're called to pray. Those last two are are, are so interconnected. Paul writes this here, don't worry, don't fret, but instead pray. Paul says, don't be focused on those things. Don't be focused, see, right? Point two, don't be focused on those things that worry you, but instead pray about them. That when we're worried and we're fearful, it takes over these different parts of our life and it fills our waking thoughts and we don't have the power to stop it. So Paul says, keep your mind focused on Jesus. We know it's hard to do when we're full of fear. I think it's time we get real here and we say, many of us have felt like this. Maybe you felt like this lately where you're full of fear. I'm fearful of this virus. I find it hard to be all into God's church or the Jesus movement because I'm fretting that the people around me will get sick with any horrible health condition. Maybe you say, it's hard for me to be invested in this movement of God because I don't even know what tomorrow's going to be bringing I'm worried about what the rest of 2020 is going to bring. Come on, we've had enough. Paul's words don't tell you to forget your fear. They don't tell you to diminish your fear, but instead turn them to God. I know it's easier said than done, but focus again on Jesus who promises that he'll work things together for good, whether in this lifetime or in the next, whether we know it or whether we don't. It's not that your fear isn't fair. It's not that your fear isn't real. It's that we, and believe me, it's we, I'm involved in this all the time. It's that we hold on to the fear and we haven't involved Jesus in it. So we haven't been focused, (laughs) point two again, we haven't been focused on Jesus that helps us push out the fear through prayer. So the church is united, the church is focused, the church is praying, and because of all that, the church is called to act. The church is called into action. Philippians 4, 4 through 5 says, Celebrate God all day, every day. Revel in Him. Make it as clear to anyone that you meet that you're on their side. You're working with them and not against them. Church, God has called you and I to act in this world because someone needs to on behalf of God. Someone needs to help others hear about a better way of living than one consumed with fear. God has called you and I to action to go to people who are full of worry and to tell them that they can have it a better way. It's back like we read in Acts. Separate for me Barnabas and Saul and go to the work to which I've called them. And they sent them away. The truth is your and my names can be put in there that instead of Barnabas and Saul, it, it could easily say, Keith and Jacob, go into the world and do the work that I've called you. Hannah and Matt, go into the world and do the work that I've called you. Put your name in there because God's calling you and calling me into action. It's Matthew 28, 19 through 20. Go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Lord. Baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and the Holy Spirit and teaching them 
to obey everything I've commanded and I will be with you through it. Here's where it all comes together for me, church. The church is called to be united, focused, praying and acting in this world because the world needs it. Here's a quote that I've loved, and the pastor that said it has done bad things, and I don't want to even get into that, but I don't want it to be distracted by the, the quote. The local church is the hope of the world. I hope you believe that. I hope you believe that. I have to, right? I believe that. If not, we don't have any hope, right? The local church is the hope of the world. You and I, the church that acts like this, that acts united, that acts focused, that is praying, and that is acting the world outside these walls and sometimes the world inside these walls needs hope. And no one else can give the kind of hope like the church can by being like this. I want to share two quick examples of where I've seen this acted out. And one is right here in, in this building. Through the beginning of this whole quarantine uh, thing, the people that were in this building worked this way. The band, the, the, not, the, not that they're perfect, believe me, especially the band, but, but no, they worked together with the band and the people upstairs and Pastor Tom and those that were around and helping. That's where the church came alive to me. I saw it again and it made me excited because there was a, un, there was a unity. There was a focus. We had one goal, right? We had one goal to not let God's word be shut down in the midst of whatever was going on outside. We prayed about it. We worried sometimes. I worried sometimes, but then I turned it to God in prayer. Not that I get it right all the time, but we did. We prayed, and then we acted. That's where I saw the church come alive. Pastor Tom told me, tell them a little bit about what you saw during the quarantine. That's what I saw. I saw the church. There was a small number of us in here. I saw the church come alive. The other example happened this week, and I don't usually get very personal, uh, but this week's been really crazy for me. Um, I wasn't going to share it, but it ties in, and uh, it, it helped me make sense of these four things on the screen, that if you have watched the news at all this week, there's been a man named Mike Jensen, uh, who has been in the news, that was a Waterloo man that was found missing. Uh, Mike is a dear friend of mine, and I've known him for about 10 years. Um, he was uh, the guy that got me into worship leading, that he gave me my first chance to, to worship lead, so if, if that's something you don't like, you can take it up with him, but... Uh, um, he, he pushed me to be where I am now, and I count him as one of my dearest friends. And so, Mike, if you hadn't heard the story, Mike is a, a man who uh, has had a hard seven years battling brain cancer and, uh, and went through treatments, and because of the treatments, uh, he got dementia and, and ended up in a nursing home because he just couldn't be cared for at home anymore. And somehow this week, Mike got out of the nursing home through a window, and he went missing for three and a half days. So we got the call Monday night that, that he had gone missing, uh, I went over Wednesday and, and was part of the search team of, of hundreds of people that came together to look, uh, and we had no idea where he was, we had no idea what he was doing, uh, we had no idea what he was thinking or where he could possibly be. Um, but Friday, the story ends out well because Friday we got the call at 11 o'clock that uh, Mike was found uh, by a random person that wasn't even looking for him, uh, which is God, uh, what's the song we do, there's nothing that our God can't do, that was going through my head. Um, so Mike was found, but what, what's amazing is that team of people, like whether it's the Mighty Ducks or whether it's the church or whether it's a team of people who care, they came together and acted like the church. They were united. We were united with one purpose and one focus, and that was to find Mike. There was a lot of worry, but we prayed. We prayed as, as a community, and there was prayers all over for, for Mike, and then we acted, and, and, and they, they, God moved. God acted through us and through random people to bring Mike home safe, and he's, he's in the hospital, and he's going to be okay. Um, that changed my idea of what it looks like to be the church. It's not in these walls, right? It doesn't have to be right here. This isn't church right here. Church is out doing these things that are united, we're focused, we're praying, and we're acting. So guess what? We're called to do the same. The clip from Mighty Ducks, remember they're all individuals, but these lines uh, come together and I want to update them. Just when you think they're about to break apart, the church moves together. When the wind blows hard and the sky is black, the church moves together. And when everyone says, that one hits me from, from that story I told about Mike, when everyone said it couldn't be done, the church moves together. So church, each of you individually, 
God has invited you to be part of a team, and that sounds corny, but it's true. God's called you to be on his team, the church, and it's time to move. It's time to move together, to be united, focused, praying, and acting to help this broken world that we live in offer a better opportunity, a better way out, a better way of living. That's what I've got to say today. Let's pray. Lord God, I thank you so much for this opportunity to be in your place, to be in your your community of people gathered, Lord, that, that we're not in a church, but we are the church. Lord, thank you for these reminders through Scripture that tell us we're called to be unified, we're called to be focused, we're called to pray when we get worried, and we're called to act for you, that you've called us to it. And the great thing is through all of it, you're with us. Lord God, I pray for all those in, in worship here that somebody heard something that maybe moves them to a different, deeper understanding or somebody on the other side of a screen is moved into action today. And Lord God, as your church gathered, may we pray the prayer your son Jesus taught us to pray, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom done, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not in temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen.